Hey Mustangs, in this video we're going to be taking a look at osmosis, the effects osmosis have on cells, and osmoregulation. So first, a quick recap of osmosis. So we already learned in class that osmosis is the movement of water molecules from high concentration to low concentration down its concentration gradient until it hits equilibrium. Equilibrium, where it gets about equal on both sides. Remember that it doesn't stop once it reaches equilibrium. Once it gets equal on both sides, then we're going to see um, small movement of water across the membrane. If a molecule moves here, a molecule moves back the other way. Um, so the, it still continues to move. The water molecules still continue to move after they've reached equilibrium. It's just about equal on both sides. So uh, we have a quick visual here. So here we see that this side has a high concentration of water molecules. This side has a lower concentration of water molecules. So these water molecules molecules will want to move down their concentration gradient to where there's less. And in the case of water, it's facilitated diffusion. They go through a uh, membrane protein called aquaporin. So if we watch here, water molecules will move until it hits equilibrium. Um, once it hits equilibrium, you'll still have some movement of water molecules across, uh, but now we have about equal on both sides and uh, less movement of these water molecules. Now, osmosis um, does not just depend on the water itself. It can also depend upon solute concentrations, and we had talked about this in class as well. So the amount of solutes can affect osmosis. Free water diffuses from an area where there's a lower concentration of solutes to an area where it's higher concentration of solutes. Now notice I'm not saying that water is moving from a higher concentration of water to a lower concentration of water. Now we're talking about the solutes, and it seems opposite here. Okay, so where there's a low concentration of solutes, the water is going to want to move from there to a higher concentration of solutes. So I really like this picture right here. So you see that in this tube we have water and we have a uh, solute here. In this case we're looking at sugar molecules. And then we have a membrane here. The sugar molecules cannot pass through that membrane, so they are uh, non it's not permeable to the sugar molecules. They're usually too large in order to pass through that membrane there. On this side, we see that there's less sugar molecules. On this side, we see that there's more sugar molecules. So the water is going to want to move from an area where there's less of a solute to an area where there's more of a solute. If we zoom in here, it comes down to free water molecules. So on this side over here, there's more free water molecules that can move, whereas on the other side, we see that because of polar interactions with the, the sugar molecule here, that there's less free water, because a lot of these water molecules are interacting with our solute here. So because of this, the water is going to want to move from an area where there's less solutes to an area where there's more solutes, and it looks something like this. Okay. So the water wants to move to the other side where there is less solutes to try to balance out in that way. All right. Now, cells don't exist by themselves. Cells are, are not in some closed system here. Um, we are constantly putting stuff into our bodies. Stuff is constantly coming out of our bodies, and that's going to definitely affect our cells. So there's different environments that we can find cells in. So the first is an isotonic solution. Isotonic means that there's an equal number of solutes inside versus outside of the cell. And in that case, you're going to see that because of the solute concentrations being the same inside and outside of the cell, there's going to be no net movement of water. Um, so the cell's not going to lose or gain water. There's going to be equal amounts of water going in and water going out because the solutes are equal. So isotonic, that's what our cells prefer. Um, is that in environmental condition to be in a space where there's equal solutes inside and outside, so that way you're not losing water, you're not gaining water, it's kind of a just right thing going on. Hypertonic solution, on this one the key to remember is going to be the hyper part. Okay, so this part right here. Hyper means more. Okay. So a hypertonic solution means that there's more solute outside of the cell than inside of the cell. Um, so here with more solute outside than inside of the cell, that means that the water, remember, is going to want to move from an area where there's less of the solute to an area where there's more. So the water is going to want to move out of the cell into the solution out here. Okay. 
So solute concentration is greater outside than inside the cell. And that is going to result in a net movement of water out of the cell. And that's going to cause the cell to overall lose water, and it's going to cause the cell to shrivel. And it could actually get to a point where the cell actually dies. So the cell can lose so much water, the water just continues to move out to try to balance out, um, that the, the cell will shrivel so much and die. All right, then we have a hypotonic solution. Hypo, if we look at that there, so we look at the word hypo. Hypo, prefix hypo, means less. So we're looking at a solution that has less solutes outside than inside the cell. And as a result of that, since there's less solutes here, more solutes there, water's going to want to move from outside of the cell inside. So hyper hypotonic solution, we have solute concentration greater inside than outside the cell. That's going to cause more water to want to move in. So you get a net movement of water into the cell. The cell is gaining water. It can swell, swell, swell until eventually bursts. So if a cell is in a hypotonic solution, the water just keeps moving and moving and moving in until eventually it's going to burst. Um, we call that lysis. So it's lysed. It's gotten to the point where it's actually bursts open. So that's your hypotonic solution. Now when you're looking at plants versus animal cells, everything I just went over applies more for uh, a cell that does not have a cell wall, so animal cells. So we look here, this is a hypotonic solution. Water's gonna wanna go in, cell's gonna burst. Isotonic, equal movement in and out. So no swelling or shriveling because it's equal movement of water. In a hypertonic solution where there's a lot of solute outside, water's gonna wanna leave the cell, and the cell's gonna shrivel and could eventually die because of that. Now when you look at plant cells, plants, because of their cell wall, um, so this could apply to plants, your prokaryotes like bacteria, fungi, stuff like that, they have a cell wall. So for them, most organisms with a cell wall, hypotonic is actually preferred. Um, the cell swells and we call that turgid. So that's actually normal for many organisms that have a cell wall. So being in a hypotonic solution is actually preferred. Cell swells, the cell wall prevents them from bursting. So bursting isn't a, process, a, a problem here. Lysis isn't a, a problem in uh, the case of a plant cell. If a plant is, uh, has a cell in isotonic solution, um, where it's equal in and out, we say that it's flaccid, it's kind of loose. So if you picture a flower, so flower has its stem and everything. If it's under its normal conditions of a hypotonic solution, then it's gonna be very tight and the flower would be kind of standing upright. If a flower doesn't have, um, if it's an isotonic solution, then what we'd see that the cells uh, start to get flaccid and the flower would actually kind of droop a little bit. And you could actually tell if a cell doesn't have enough water uh, or a plant cell. You can see, when you look at a plant, you can see if their cells don't have enough water because they're very flaccid, they're kind of just hanging over. And then same thing that happens to an animal cell will happen to a plant cell when put in a hypertonic solution. So hyper meaning a lot outside of the cell. Water's gonna wanna move out. The cell will actually shrivel. And we're actually gonna take a look at this in class. All right, osmoregulation. Um, our cells, and basically life in general has like a Goldilocks complex, okay? Uh, Goldilocks, and it wants things to be just right. And that's what osmoregulation is all about. It wants to be able to regulate and control the amount of solutes inside and outside the cell um, and maintain water balance. You don't want a cell to have too much water in it and explode. You don't want a cell to have not enough water and shrivel up and die. So um, osmoregulation is what that is all about, um, making sure that you have the right amount of water inside the cell. And most of uh, most living things are going to prefer, of course, if it doesn't have a cell wall, an isotonic solution to be bathed in. Um, so that's what we try to do inside of our bodies, our blood versus the inside of the cells, trying to make it isotonic um, so that way water doesn't leave and water doesn't exit uh, too quickly. Uh, so here we have a paramecium. This paramecium, uh, which lives in pond water, is going to have a hard time because there's more solutes in the paramecium compared to the surrounding 
um, pond water. So it's in a hypotonic solution and water is going to want to move inward and the paramecium could swell and basically pop. Uh, it's a single celled organism. So this right here is a contractile vacuole that actually pumps water out of the paramecium. So it does have the problem of a lot of water coming in, but it solves it, osmoregulation solves it by pumping water out. So that way it doesn't swell and burst. We also see this in fish. Um, I'm talking about a lot of organisms that live in water here, but this applies to us as well. And this is what we do with our blood, keeping our blood certain amounts of water in it and solutes so that way we don't have a mass exit of water or intake of water in our cells. Um, but the reason why we look at these guys is because they're, they're living in water uh, and different types of water. So here, this is a saltwater fish. A saltwater fish lives in a hypertonic solution. Um, all the solutes that are in the ocean, all the salt and stuff like that, actually causes water to want to leave their body. So as a result of that, they have a problem that water's always wanting to leave their cells. So one of the ways that they sol solve it, part of, part of their osmoregulation, is they hold on to as much water as they can. Uh, they try to release very little water, um, and they even drink a lot of water constantly throughout their daily lives. All right, that is it for osmosis and osmoregulation.